Eminem contributed to destroying one of the biggest magazine empires within hip-hop. In the mid-1980s, Dave Mays was a student at Harvard University and struggled to make friends. One day, he was sitting alone in his dorm bedroom and heard hip-hop music coming from another room. He discovered what was probably the only person on campus who liked hip-hop other than him. So he went over, knocked on the door, and introduced himself. He met a man named John Schechter. Almost 30 years later, Rap music is heard all over Harvard's campus. Hip hop is culture known all over the planet. And this spontaneous meeting between Dave and John is part of the reason why. Back when John and Dave first met, hip hop was a very niche genre of music and its audience was mainly based in the inner cities. Although both of the source's founders were white guys, Dave grew up in DC and John grew up in Philadelphia, so they were exposed to this brand new art form and culture. As they became friends, they decided to pitch a show to college radio. At the time, Harvard Radio mainly played classical music. Their show would be called Street Beat and would play music from the streets. College Radio was reluctant but gave them a slot at 1 a.m. on Friday nights. But for many, Street Beat at 1 a.m. was the only time you could hear brand new hip hop music. Maze and Schechter were also in the right place at the right time. In the early to mid 80s, the biggest hip hop names were The Sugar Hill Gang, Run DMC, Grandmaster Flash. When they started towards the late 80s, hip hop was becoming a more meaningful and socially conscious genre of music. Rakim and Boogie Down Productions would be early pioneers, followed up by NWA and Public Enemy. The golden age of hip hop was just starting to emerge. Dave was also keen to promote musicians from Boston too, one of which was the Almighty RSO. This group of six guys included a man named Ray Benzino who would become very important later on. The radio show soon turned into a business. They had an audience listening to their show, so Dave thought he could attract sponsors. However, the people he approached simply didn't believe him when he told them that he had a thousand people listening to him every weekend. On the show, they told viewers that if they phoned in and told them their address, he would give them a newsletter. With this new mailing list, Mays could come back to sponsors and give the exact names and addresses of their customers. This newsletter became known as The Source. The name came from krs One song, Still Slippin', where he raps, you wanna hear a fresh rhyme, you come to the source. What started as a newsletter quickly evolved into a magazine. At first, it was just one page. The second newsletter was six pages. The one after was 16 pages and formatted like a magazine. Most importantly, the third issue contained advertising, meaning that this was something they could make money out of and continue doing. Dave focused on the business side, whereas John worked on the editorial. This was the dynamic throughout their working relationship from here on out. Ed Young would later help Dave with the business side, and James Bernard would work with John on editorial. During this period, Dave was handed a book about a guy named Jan Wenner. He was the founder of Rolling Stone magazine and transformed a small publication about rock music into the voice of a generation. Hip hop was the new rock and roll, and The Source was trying to be the next Rolling Stone magazine. After graduating, they moved offices to New York, and the success continued to grow. One of its biggest features was a column named Unsigned Hype. Any unsigned artist could send in a demo, and they would feature the best one. The names discovered throughout this column include Biggie, DMX, Common, and Eminem. There was also the magazine's iconic rating system. Each album was given between one and five mics. One mic meant it was terrible, and five meant it was a hip-hop classic. Some of the albums which got five mics were Nas Illmatic, A Tribe Called Quest's Low End Theory, and Ice Cube's America's Most Wanted. Eminem, as we'll find out later on, would never achieve the accolade of five mics. On top of the magazine, the 1994 Source Awards provided hip-hop with its own award show and put the spotlight on artists that the Grammys overlooked. The Source was quickly becoming the central voice of hip-hop. What made The Source huge was that it was true hip-hop journalism. If they thought that a popular artist had a bad album, they weren't afraid to tell them. And this created a few enemies as well. Cypress Hill would burn copies of The Source on stage. Public Enemy's 1994 song, I Stand Accused, showed a video of Chuck D and Flava Flav smashing up the office of a magazine named The Sauce. Hip-hop legends were calling them out, and it wasn't always a good look. The controversy between artists and The Source continued to bubble up, so Dave decided to step in. He wanted The Source to be about showing love and being passionate about hip-hop. He told the editors that they could still be critical, but in a way that's more respectful. The main arguments came between Dave and editors James Bernard and Reginald Dennis. Bernard and Dennis were simply not willing to compromise 
their journalistic integrity, and stood behind everything in the magazine. While this tension was brewing, Dave would agitate these two editors even further. His old friends from Boston, the almighty RSO, had finally got signed and were releasing a new album. Dave wanted the editors to show RSO some love and write a nice feature about them, but they refused to do so. The source was journalism and not PR. With tension building up on both sides, Dave decided to make a power move. He chose to have an article about RSO in the source, published without any of the editors knowing. When the magazine was published, he put the copy on James Bernard's desk and showed him the article. He went ballistic. As revenge, Bernard sent out a petition for Mays to step down and got multiple staff members to sign it. He also sent out letters to labels as to why Dave is not fit to run the source. However, Dave was too emotionally attached to the source to leave, so Bernard was suspended for this behavior, and to make matters worse, six other prominent editorial staff simply walked out. A statement from the staff said, Two of us were threatened by Ray Dog, Benzino, and our publisher did nothing about it, and went behind our backs and stuck this puff piece into the magazine about the group. By then, Dave had very few friends left at the source. Over the years, John had been slowly dissociating himself from the magazine and felt uneasy about being a white guy writing about black culture and music. Ed Young was the only partner who stood by Dave and didn't want to ruin what they had built together. But there was another person who also had Dave's back. It was at this moment that Benzino was brought into the fray. The people who walked out were making threats at Dave so he felt that things could get ugly. Benzino and his group provided Dave with the protection he now needed. With Benzino, the magazine also had a direct connection to the streets and hip-hop culture. The departed staff were replaced. In their absence, the Source launched the 1995 Source Awards, which became one of the most iconic nights in hip-hop history that we did a whole video about. The mid-90s was the crest of the wave for the Source. It had become the new Rolling Stone magazine. From now on, it was about maintaining that top spot as the voice of hip-hop. The first pitfall to get in their way was a new magazine called Double XL, and its list of staff members contained some familiar faces. James Bernard and Reginald Dennis started this magazine in 1997 and became the competition. Towards the turn of the century, the internet began to slowly take over and had the power to make magazines irrelevant, even obsolete. Change was coming and the source had to move fast. The source needed a website, so Dave simply mortgaged the magazine, which gave him a $12 million loan in 1999. But all didn't go to plan. Dave spoke about companies hustling him to build websites, and this was something nobody really knew about at the time. The website was apparently too early and not making any money. Meanwhile, they had loan repayments to pay off. So a percentage of the source was sold to a private equity company named Black Enterprise, which took control of 18% of the business. This helped Dave to get the source back onto its feet. The Source Awards 2002 were canceled, but were back the next year. Black Enterprise then offered Dave more loans to keep the source going. He gladly accepted these loans, but at one stage, he realized that this was a power move. Dave needed another loan, and Black Enterprise said they would give it to them if they owned 50% of the source, and they would work under him. Dave refused to let anyone else take control of the source, and this was financially devastating. Alongside these financial difficulties, the source was also feuding with Eminem. By the early 2000s, he was insanely popular, superstardom, and reaching audiences other rappers could only dream about. Eminem had just won an Oscar for 8 Mile, but what he wanted more than anything was five mics in the source. His 2002 album, The Eminem Show, only received four mics. Before this album was Marshall Mathers' LP, which is considered by many a hip-hop classic. Only received four mics too. Slim Shady LP, as far as I can tell, was not even reviewed by the source. Eminem felt that no matter how good his album was, it was never going to be five mics. Eminem's whiteness became the main issue. Benzino believed that Eminem was overrated because he was white. But on the other side of the coin, Eminem believed that Benzino was preventing him from getting five mics because he was white. Eminem and Benzino would go back and forth dissing each other in tracks. But it would always seem like Benzino was fighting a losing battle. Eminem was a much better rapper, he was much bigger, and he was also now an incredibly powerful figure in hip-hop with two of the biggest stars ever behind him. Eminem was the biggest rapper in the world. Arguably, the second biggest rapper at that time was 50 Cent, who was signed to Shady Records. Then you have Eminem's lifelong ties where he was signed to Dr. Dre. Eminem had the talent and social clout that far outweighed Benzino and the source. This beef also damaged the magazine's journalistic integrity. 
most hip-hop fans would be on Eminem's side rather than Benzino's. There was an all-too-obvious conflict of interest going on. On top of that, there were also financial consequences. Eminem's label Interscope also pulled out all of its advertising from the source. But the source and Benzino were suddenly presented with a lifeline. The magazine was tipped off about a forgotten old demo tape by Eminem. In one of the songs, he derides black women and, even more damningly, drops a couple of words that wouldn't help his case as a white rapper. Eminem claimed that this song came out when he was 16 and was off the back of a relationship with the black woman. The source, meanwhile, claimed he was in his early 20s when this tape came out. This wasn't a good look for Eminem, but he had the social clout and respect within hip-hop as well as the industry, which allowed for his apology to be accepted. However, he went on hiatus in 2005 and took a brief break from music. One of Eminem's diss tracks against Benzino was called Nail in the Coffin, which arguably ended Benzino's career. But the final Nail in the Coffin for the Source magazine would come from another staff member feud. In February 2005, the Source's editor, Kim Osorio, was fired from her job. Dave Mays and Benzino claimed that this was due to a poor working relationship, missed deadlines, and that she was sleeping with various rappers. Osorio decided to hit back and take legal action against them. She testified that Mays repeatedly begged her to have sex with them, and another person told her he would knock me upside my head. She sued them for sexual harassment and gender discrimination and won a lawsuit worth $15.5 million. The financial damage of this case was another deadly blow to the source. The reputational damage was arguably even worse. By 2006, Mays and Benzino were forced out, and the Source magazine faced bankruptcy. Although, the Source still lives on in a zombie-like way through its website and occasional print editions, things would never be the same. The Source was intended to spread the love of hip-hop, and by this stage, they were no longer needed. Hip-hop became the new rock and roll, and the Source was the magazine that helped it along the way.